Hey there, it's Mike Blackford. Welcome to another episode of the Modern Financial Advisor Podcast. This week on the show, Beatriz Acevedo, the CEO and co-founder of Suma Wealth is with me for a conversation that is going to blow your mind. I know, right? That's a bold statement, but here's the deal. Beatriz and her team at Suma Wealth have uncovered what I believe just might be the secret to unlocking a huge amount of growth for your financial advisory firm. And the funny thing is, it's something that just happened as a natural extension of their focus on serving the Latinx community. However, as you'll learn from this conversation, this concept is present in many communities. You are going to love Beatrice. I mean, it's not every day that you get to hear from an Emmy-winning TV producer who launched a fintech company and, oh, by the way, sits on the board of the 2028 Los Angeles Olympic Games. Quick, go grab a beverage. You're going to need to hydrate for this episode. Now, while you're grabbing your frosty beverage, make sure you click the subscribe button on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Play, the YouTubes, or wherever you like to get your podcast jam on. And if you have a question or a suggestion for a topic or a guest, hit me up. I'm basically at Mike Langford everywhere on the internet. So you can shoot me a note on your favorite socials or send me an email, podcast at finservemarketing.com. Okay, let's get to the conversation with Beatriz Acevedo. Well, Beatriz Acevedo, wonderful to see you. Welcome to the Modern Financial Advisor podcast. Thank you so much for having me, Mike. Really appreciate it. I'm I'm thrilled, and I have to say, I'm a bit humbled now. Like we are in our you know pre conversation here before we click record. You're telling me like, oh yeah, well when I was on with uh, Guy Raz for how I built this, you know, which by the way, anybody who's in business and listen in entrepreneurship particularly has listened to that podcast probably a lot of episodes. Like I've never met somebody who's been on his show, so awesome. This is great. Uh-huh. Thank I'm you. Humbled. <laughs> it's you, really cool. You. Oh yeah, absolutely. My my pleasure. So I'm super thrilled to have you on the show and I'm I'm usually genuinely happy to have everybody on the show. <laughs> but when when you when you're a a a, a, a PR prep person, uh Dana reached out uh to, to talk to me about Suma Wealth and and why we might want to talk about it on the show. I'm like I need to get this founder of the show. I actually had to look further down to find like, who is the founder of this company? Cause this sounds amazing because I'm kind of honestly obsessed with companies that serve specific communities. Right. And, and when I say community, I, I mean something different than a niche, right? A lot of people say, well, you're going to be in niche marketing. So you're going to focus on a niche. I think a community is a little bit different, right? A, a, a niche is like an attribute of the client. Like, okay, I serve men in this age bracket or people who own businesses or whatever. But a community is like more interactive, right? It, it, they're, they're people who have shared experiences. They're people who probably interact with each other more frequently and so forth. So let's dive in there. Let's kick this off. Hit us with the elevator pitch for SUMA and why the Latinx community is where you chose to focus. Yes, of course. Well, listen, I think uh, it's a perfect segue for, for what you just mentioned regarding community. Because we launched this company as a community first versus product first company. And that is very strange when you think about fintech, right? You're like, okay, what's your product? Everybody launches product first. And it makes a lot of sense, except when you haven't been able to build a community at scale by launching product first. Okay, so Suma is a fintech company that focuses on super serving primarily Latino youth who tend to be U.S. born, English dominant, college educated, and have to manage their finances and the finances on average of another three family members, okay, that tend to be older, immigrant, Spanish dom, so very different than they are. And, you know, we have a a hypothesis, but now we have data to prove that we're on the right path, that by really supporting them, these influencers, Sherpas, navigators of these families and communities, we can really close the wealth gap within one generation. And the gap, wealth gap, just so everybody knows, today is at a 20 cents to a dollar. So we have a long ways to go. We're not wow. at 99 cents to a dollar. Like yeah. it's, a, it's a big goal. Um, so Suma is that, you know, an all-in-one platform that leans very hard into culture and into community um, to explain financial concepts that might have been intimidating or daunting or difficult mm. to understand. 
not just to our own um, Latino, Latinx, Latina community. People get triggered with how you name them in my own community. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> um, but we're excited to see that we have a big crossover. So about 30% of our users are not Latinos. Um, we're black, white, Asian, multiracial. So it's really exciting, right? Just a different mm -hmm. approach on financial literacy and tools and products and services. That's what that's what Suma is. I, I absolutely love this so much. And we're going to dig into like all the pieces of this. One thing that I'd love to hear from you, and I actually don't think you and I chatted about this on the prep call, uh, which is great. So I'll be learning about this first time is what was your aha moment for this? Right. You mentioned this community and so forth and, and you had, you hit on a couple of things there. Number one, it was for uh, the younger generation, right? These are, you know, uh, U S born, English speaking, college educated. You hit a couple of, of notes there. What was that aha moment for you? Like, wh why did you decide like, this is the entry point to this community uh, and this is who we want to serve what did you see and, and, and how did it, you realize this needs to be a business? Yeah. So first of all, this was not my idea as far as like as a company. It was my co-founder's idea, Javier Gutierrez, who when I sold my previous company, um, he was like, I have the perfect idea for you. I wanted to raise a fund and invest in Latina entrepreneurs. And he yeah. was like, no, 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 you need to, let's launch a fintech company together. And I really thought he was on drugs. I was like, what? Like, I'm not a finance <laughs> person. Like, no. Uh, yeah. And he was like, no, no, but that's exactly it. Like, we need an approach that's more like a community builder that knows how to build, you know, communities at scale and brands at scale and leans hard into culture. Because in fintech, there's so many white label solutions, which obviously, you know, you can just, you know, pay for an API and you're connected and you just white label it with your own brand. Um, but what people didn't quite get was how to really talk to our very specific and very important, actually, demographic. Um, going back to your point of like, you know, niches, I it kills me when people are like, oh, you're in the niche of, I'm like, I mean, no niche. I mean, this is like, this is the new American majority, make no mistake. And the census is out and people who choose to see it is great. I happen to be of the same demographic, so I'm super lucky, but as a business person, if I'd see this was, you know, the growth driver was any other community, I'd be all over that, right? It happens to be my own community. So um, looking into it, I just thought, well, I mean, can we, what's, what's happened in the past? What's happened with the other fintech companies that haven't been able to fully acquire these young Latinos or older Latinos at scale? And as you know, there's 30,000 fintechs in the U.S. So there's a lot of people who have tried to specifically serve this audience and some who are just general market and like, okay, we'll get them by default because these younger generations speak English. Um, but it was that. It was like the aha moment was really the pandemic, like, you know, looking into the data of like, we weren't only the ones with the highest death rates, but also with the highest economic hardship. I thought, this is crazy. Like, we're drivers of GDP. We're such big contributors to the economy. We're so young. We're entering the workforce at the most accelerated rate. And our families don't have a thousand dollars in savings for an emergency. There's something really wrong with this, right? But we're also the biggest spenders. So I'm like, oh, how could we be the biggest spenders and we don't have any money save for an emergency? So I think that was the aha moment of like, there's something really wrong here. And I thought my previous company was a digital media company. And so we built it to continues to be the largest digital media company for this demographic in the U.S. And I thought, well, with all those learnings, what would happen if we use culture uh, and lean hard into finance? So let's experiment with that. And it started to really work out from the very beginning. We had massive engagement and fandom and started to build a big community. And we thought, OK, we hit into something right. Culture mixed with finance, mixed with you belong here, which is a feeling that very few kids in our demographic feel because it's like if it's in Spanish, it's not for them. That's for their parents. Right. Some of them don't speak Spanish, although they're they love their culture. If it's in English, but it's general market, it's not for them either. I mean, it's fine, but nothing is connecting them emotionally to that brand or that company or that service. And you have to understand finance is a really um, tricky subject in our community. You know, we saw our parents or our grandparents lose all, all of their wealth or, or whatever they had saved up in their lifetimes in their countries of origin. So there's a lot of post-traumatic syndrome uh, from money. Um, so coming to the U.S., 
you know, you might have not had that experience personally, but you grew up listening to that every single day. So the distrust uh, that most gen- it cuts across generations have in financial institutions or fintech companies is really, really big. And nobody has really been able to master that emotional connection of like, you can trust me and you belong here. So I think that's what's been, you know, very different mm. about what we do- we're doing. It's so interesting. You hit on something that I think is often missed by people when they talk about the niche, right? Or they, you know, they talk about, oh, you serve this, this this niche market because you've identified certain attributes that make that market attractive, right? And then right. you can make your marketing message sing to those people, right? Oh, I I serve people in the tech industry. Great. So now I talk about stock options, you know, and how to manage those types of things or whatever it is. And I show up at a few tech events. But you hit on something that I, I've often advised people from a marketing perspective is like, you need to go native into that community, right? You need to go and be amongst them and be one of them. Yeah. Because if you want to hang out and, and relate to the tech community, you can't just be some financial advisor who says, I know some ins and outs about tech stuff. You actually need, they need to feel like you're there. Like you need to be showing up to tech, you know, meetups and so forth and understand the difference between Ruby on Rails and PHP programming and all these different things, right? Uh, in order for them to feel like you're one of them, uh, but what you were just describing is you really, I mean, A, because you're from the community, but B, you, you understand the persona and what drives them and the intricacies of their lives in such a strong way that I'm not going to say it was like easy because no startup is easy, but it gave you a stronger runway because you could, you know, you, you've walked a mile in their shoes to some extent. You know, a lot of people in your, in your circle that have as well. Yes and no. So I learned by making a lot of mistakes in my previous company because I am not the demo, right? I'm 55. Sure. So I'm certainly not a Gen Z or a millennial. Yeah. Uh, my kids are. I'm not a US born. I'm not English dominant. I'm their parents. Okay. So I made that mistake that most companies make, you know, oh, let's target Latinos in Spanish um, and you know, whatever it was. And I, I made that mistake in my previous company. And then I, when I would look at the analytics, I'd be like, Oh my gosh, why are these people so old? <laughs> like me, uh, when we were supposed to be the alternative, right. And digital right. media, you know, we already have other, you know, broadcasters who target those parents in Spanish, like why, why, why? And, and we were doing our con producing our content in Spanish too, but it was super cool. And it was on YouTube and it was like, tutorials for like 18 year olds and we're like why are the 50 year olds here like and we quickly and then we started to experiment we're like what if we did it in english but if we did it in english then there were thousands of youtubers that did english and how would we be different so we're like we have to do in culture and that's i think how we started with that more than in language it has to be in culture yes it was english but it had to be very very evident it's almost like you know tell me you're a latino without speaking spanish right and so exactly that and so I had the benefit of, you know, making mistakes and failing and redoing it um, and learning that for, for Suma. So not because you're from the community, you can be arrogant to think, you know, oh, okay, like I'm, I'm a Latina, like I know all Latinos, this is what they want. I mean, we did a lot of tests at the beginning because I thought even with my own kids, I'm like, okay, well, my kids are off to college. You know, college is definitely not cheap in two private universities or twins. And, you know, I just assume that Gen Z's had student debt on their mind, right? And we're like, oh, but let's, let's look at the data. Let's see what they want. Our Gen Z's within our platform do not have student debt on their mind. They have early retirement on their mind, right? And I would have never known should I just assumed, right? Or I think this is, but I'm not a Gen Z'er, right? I'm not a, and they're just like, tell me how I can retire as fast as possible. And I think that's fascinating because you know, most of them haven't even started working and they're thinking about retiring, but maybe it's because they see their parents or their grandparents work so hard, never being able to retire, accumulate wealth. So they're like, I want, I want the plan now at 18, which I thought was really interesting. So, I mean, listen, we're lucky that now we live in a day and age of so much data. There's so much information. There's so much test and learn that you can do um, that. I really encourage people to take advantage of that, right. To really, really do that social listening when you're building a product, when you're building a service, when you're building your marketing materials, to your point, it's really, really important that you don't 
let your mind go with your unconscious bias, right? Even from my own community, I had the unconscious bias of thinking, no, no, this is what they need. Should I have built a product for them to pay off student debt, which by the way, there's thousands out there, like that would have definitely not been successful. You know, it's so interesting. You hit on something that I, I've often talked about the reverse of, of what you just said. Like, so you have assumptions about you know, what people wanted. And um, I often, we hear, hear from CEOs in the, the financial services community who are like, well, you know, I don't think our clients are on, are using Facebook or whatever. And they're talking about their older clients and they're talking about people in their circle, right? That look like them who walk, you know what I mean? Like they're, that are in their certain level of affluence or wealth. It's like, have you checked? Because I have a feeling some of them are actively using Facebook and Instagram and so forth or whatever. Or have you checked to see if they're listening to the podcast? Just because you don't listen to podcasts right. doesn't mean they don't listen to podcasts. So I, I often have to tell people from the opposite. And, and what we were just talking about is like, just because you think this is the way that, you know, student debt should be their number one priority. Some of them have this other priority of like, no, 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 I want to get this work thing over with, quick, <laughs> this career thing over with. Uh, that's a really fascinating insight. Do you think that's cultural or do you think that is uh, more broad for that generation or you just don't have the data, you only have it for the, for the, from a cultural No, it's broad. It's broad, is which it? is interesting. Mm -hmm. It's broad. That is very interesting. Yeah. Well, like I said, we have 30% of our users are not Latino. So, I mean, it's not like exactly yeah. split between every demographic, but yeah, it was pretty consistent, which is super interesting if you think about it, right? And you always need to be like, you know, to your point, if you're from an older generation, like I am for sure, you have to really stay on top of those trends and really be prepared to adjust very quickly. You're like, oh, it wasn't here. Okay, let's try this. Let's do this. And I mean, I guess that's the beauty that you learn working in tech also. Um, you have to, right? Because one generation to another really changes. If you thought you had it down because you know millennials, Gen Zs are nothing like millennials. And I'm sure Gen Alpha are not going to be anything like Gen Zs, right? So there's so many differences, not just within the generations, but also within the levels of acculturation, right? I'm not the same as my mom. My kids are not the same as me. Um, so yeah, there's, there's, there's always a learning, uh, moment for you there, uh, when you're thinking about your products, your services, what you're building as a company, but now there's so much data to, you know, be rational when you make your decisions and not emotional. <laughs> I, I love it. I, mean, it. I love little nuggets like this that just come up you know, in conversations with like folks like you, because I never would have thought about that either. Right. That, that young folks are sitting here like, look retirement as quickly as possible is important to me. And we could probably, you and I could probably brainstorm a whole bunch of reasons why that might be, right? Disaffected with the current work climate. There's a lot of uh, folks who really don't like corporate America. Uh, having lived through a major pandemic, many of them start to understand that life is for living. Life is not for necessarily working. That's not as an important thing. So we could just go down a so list of a whole things, bunch right. of yeah, whole hypothesis here. But it's such an important thing for the advisors and the, and, the, and the executives at wealth management firms who might be watching or listening to this episode to understand like, hey, you might want to dig into what motivates those people because we've had this urge in this industry to get younger. You have to go after younger, younger investors. Uh, to get them going. Absolutely. Well, and I think younger more and more become these influencers in families and communities. I'm not just talking about the Latino community, but, you know, they're the ones who understand more technology and new trends yeah. and, you know, what's happening. So as they, you know, grow up and they're not kids anymore where their parents make all their decisions, they have a big influences in their families, right? Yeah. And so it's super interesting that nobody, um, just misses that misses of yeah. like, okay. And what is that next generation thoughts on this? Right. If, especially if you've been advising somebody, you know, that's older, right? Like is my yeah. financial advisor personally going to connect with my kids? Maybe not. Right. Yeah. Like my financial advisor is very much in my eight age range and, you know, um, feels like somebody I'm comfortable with. Will my kids feel comfortable with him? Probably not, unless he made, yeah. you know, like a big effort for that to happen. Um, so anyway, you want to make sure that you're not missing those opportunities for sure. Yeah. 
I 100% agree. It's, it, we spend so much time talking about like how do you connect with that younger generation. I think you and I've got it on our list of things to talk about more in depth a little bit later. Uh, but it may end up being one of the ways to do it is hiring in a junior advisor who's more on the level with those folks, so that right. you know you even though they may be coming in via relationships you have with other clients or whatever, having somebody because we've talked about this on the show many times. We've talked about diversity, equity, and inclusion uh, from a variety of different angles. But there is a sense, and this really leans into what Sum is doing, that people want to feel like you get them. They, they want to feel like the advisor or the company that they're doing business with sees them as valuable and understands what's who they are. Yeah. And it's really difficult when you walk in, uh, if you're a young person, and you see the stuffy old oak line oak <laughs> office there with the 60-year-old guy behind the counter who you just don't relate to that well, right? It's yeah. a lot more, a lot difficult, right? A lot more intimidating, you know, yeah. than somebody that you're like, okay, like I, this feel, I mean, you also want the experience, so it's tricky, right? So I think yeah. your idea of like having somebody that you are, that's coming up in the ranks or even giving up internship opportunities, I'm big on that because, you know, I, I call them like my Gen Z's in residence, right? And it's like, okay, what am I missing? You know, what? you know, criticize what I'm doing, what I'm, and sometimes it, they're, you know, it's harsh, harsh feedback, yeah. which is good. It's like, yeah. oh, this is so cheesy. Oh, this would never connect with me. Oh, this is not. And we thought it was brilliant. And yeah, we're 30 years older, right? So it's yeah. like, it's good. It's good to have that perspective, even in coming in and doing like a check on like, you know, for somebody younger, how would you do this? How would you message this? What, yeah. what, platforms would you use, et cetera. So that's always, you know, they're always available in the summers for sure. So that's like, that's, that's a good goal for, for people listening. Maybe. That's a great recommendation, right? Bringing somebody into your office to work, to work there and to like truly be interested in that person as a guide. Like, you know, yeah. oftentimes you think as an older person, I'm the mentor, I'm going to show you how this is done, how the world works, younger person. But Every once in a while, you have to be open to your kid or or that younger person in your staff. They're like, can you show me how you Absolutely. use this or why this is important to you? Because I don't get it. I mean, I look at the differences between. Uh, this is actually a great transition because uh, I want to talk about your 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 previous career. Um, but I, you know, I grew up in the 1980s, right, and 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 was an adult in the 90s. You know, started my adult life in the 90s. And TV is a big part of life, like regular television where you're watching. TV and and shows and so forth. My kids, I have a a college freshman and a high school freshman. They basically don't watch TV. You know, they'll yeah. watch you know the occasional. Like my, the older one will watch some Netflix stuff. Yeah, sports. Yeah. And but my daughter is like a YouTube. Like that's yeah. how she she's a she's a high school freshman. Like I don't remember the last time she's like I'm gonna sit down and watch Netflix or whatever. Even when she has the you know the 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 big TV in the entertainment room. She's they like, never I'm watch it YouTube on the up. TV. It drives me crazy. I'm like, why are you watching a series on your phone? And like, yeah, it's fine. I'm like, the TV's right. in front of you. Like, I don't get that. But they're right. not. They're definitely not that TV generation for sure. But think about the, that simple little tiny thing. It led so much credence to what you were talking about, which is if that person consumes content differently, if they choose where they consume the content on what device, iPad, iPhone versus big screen TV sitting in the comfy chairs in the living room. Don't, doesn't it posit that they think differently than you and me? Of that course. Because they're experiencing the world differently than you and I, that that's a different consumer moving forward. Their yeah. values might be some different and all, all those types of things. So you kind of have to adjust. Yeah. And there's, I mean, if there's definitely data based on, I mean, it should, we should not need the data because it seems like a very obvious thing, but you know, people ask, where do you get your financial advice? And you ask Gen Z's and it's like from TikTok, right? Like, yeah. it's like, which is great. It's crazy, but it's also a little scary, right? Like yeah. there's so many enthusiastic people that want to give financial advice on social, which is scary to me. I mean, we try to hire yeah. some to do some of our Summaversity classes. And I'm like, oh, you, are you certified? Are you the, and they're like, no. I'm like, oh, wow. <laughs> you have a whole <laughs> channel and you're not. And all yeah. these follow like, oh my God, this is really scary. So 
But yeah. there's a place to be legit there. But yeah, you have to change the way you do things. You probably need to, like, I'm not on my videos for Suma. Like, I'm so not the demo, right? You yeah. have the those Gen Zs or millennials um, doing whatever it is that's going to be enticing to, to the audience. But yeah, you have yeah. to definitely adapt. But yes, yeah, so to your point of, for sure, you have a lot to teach from experience if you're 40, 50, 60. But you have a lot to learn from 18 and 20 year olds, for sure, you know, because it's like, where's the world going? Why is this interesting? What's the attention span? What's the messaging? Um, And so instead of thinking and yeah, don't waste the time of like, oh, I have an intern to get coffee. That's just idiotic. Like, have an intern to learn from that intern, like, you know, like really connect with how sit them in your same meetings and ask their opinion, because you'd be really, really surprised of how, how much they have to say and how many things you might be missing, actually. I agree. It's funny. You know, we as a, I, it's actually one of my least favorite things I see because you know, I'm Gen X, right? So uh, I, I, I really get frustrated when I see the Gen Xers shaking their fists saying, you know, in my generation, when we were younger, we did this. Or, you know, life was so much better when I was a kid or whatever. It's like, yeah, but you know what? My mom and dad didn't put me in a seatbelt when I was in a car, right? I rolled around on the back of a pickup truck when we were going on long family trips. Um, so maybe, the way you grew up wasn't as awesome as you remember it to be. Right, <laughs> you know I mean? right, for sure. Um, it's like you could have, and don't you remember like when you were 20 years old thinking that your parents were like missing of some course. things, like they wore it on top of the, I mean, I, you and I are uh, roughly, I think around the same uh, age. I don't want to p- put your age out there. I'll put mine out there. Um, yeah, I'm the, definitely Gen X. Gen X, right? So we're the last generation of people to become adults before the internet existed, right? right? right. So I entered the workforce and we did not have internet on our computers, right? No. People weren't walking around with smartphones and so forth. No. So we have active memory of before times. And the, we also saw the thing come up, come about and saw the value of like, oh my gosh, like I can actually send an email to somebody oh. at a, a different office oh my gosh, I can look this up online and get the answer that I need and put it into... So we saw that value, but we probably also remember having conversations with our parents or grandparents going like, no, the internet thing's valuable. And they're like, I don't need email. Yes, <laughs> yeah, yes, like, yes. Yes, you do. <laughs> I know. I remember my dad would have his assistant print his emails and then yeah. dictate her his responses back. I was like, what? Like, you're totally missing the point of email. But anyway, whatever. <laughs> My father-in-law uh, did the same thing. That is hilarious. My father-in-law literally would sit there and read out and, and just and have uh, his assistant do the same. Who, his assistant was my mother-in-law. But it was just really funny. Like, that's how they would. He would not type even on his own device. He would read them on his iPad. <laughs> that's so, so crazy, right? That that was uh, even a thing. But yeah, uh, I mean... It's, Times change. <laughs> no, but it's, 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 it really, I mean, I know we spent a little, a little uh, bit of time on this, but it's so important you know, for the advisors who are listening, again, to like understand like you really need to look at younger folks as a resource for you, right? It, for uh, sure. you know, whether the giant demographic wave, you mentioning that you know, the Latin, Latinx community is, is growing and is going to be uh, dominant in terms of population in this, culture, in this country, that's an undeniable fact. So, why wouldn't you lean into it, right? Okay, well, how do I learn about that? Well, there's some ways, right? Uh, the same thing is like, look, Father Time, you know, is undefeated. He waits for no man, right? We're all getting older and the younger generation's coming and you're going to blink your eye and those kids who are 24 years old are going to be 34 years old and running for office and running large companies and so forth. So you might want to start paying attention to them now. Now, yes, for sure. Yeah. For sure, for sure. So- I want to like jump into a completely different topic here, but I did say I'll bridge the gap because I mentioned TV. Uh, during our prep call, you mentioned that you were an Emmy-winning TV producer in Mexico before you came to the United States. So first of all, not only is this the first time that I've had somebody on the show who was on How I Built This with Guy Raz, hmm. first time I've had, I've actually interviewed somebody who's won an Emmy. All right, so this is this is neat. So <laughs> this is great. Um, but more importantly, I'd love to, you to share the story about like how did you navigate from being a TV producer to a fintech founder? Because that seems like a dramatic career <laughs> to say jump. The that least. When people think like, "All right, I think about Beatrice; she's going to change careers." 
where is she going from TV producer? People would be like, oh, podcast producer, you know, YouTube. Video. Like they, they would think a more linear. Yeah, like, entertainment this is different. media. Some sort of entertainment. Yeah. So please do tell me, I because I didn't ask you this before, so I'm fascinated to hear. Yeah, I mean, listen, I I was I was gonna you know turn fifty, so I was gonna you know massive milestone yeah. birthday, and I just wanted to do something different. And so I'd been in media and entertainment since I was a kid. I started as a, actually a radio announcer when I was eight. Um, wow. So I'd done a lot of radio. I did a lot of TV. I, and my previous company, as I mentioned, was a digital media company. And that was at, at a time when Facebook didn't even have video. So it was at the very, oh, wow. very, very early stages of digital media. Um, it was a, there's no playbook. You're sort of like inventing as you go, you know, what's YouTube and, you know, like I said, you couldn't even have video on, on Facebook. Um, so that was, I love that. I thought, okay, I went from traditional to like the most cutting edge and I built this company, you know, in a way that's the largest in, in this country. And now I've sold it and now I'm going to do philanthropy, right? That was my goal, which made sense. My family has had a family foundation for 30 years. My dad had just passed away. I had promised him I'd run it. Um, so that was going to be my transition. And the, I mentioned earlier the pandemic. I mean, the, when the pandemic hit, it was really, you know, just looking, everything I read, everything I saw was like, oh my gosh, you know, like people have, you know, so much economic hardship here. And, and, and again, like I love to read about the trillions of dollars that Latino consume Latinos consume and contribute to the economy. But I'm like, the fact that we have no financial education to know that $1,000 per family is definitely not going to be enough to save us in a pandemic or in any emergency, uh, for that matter. Um, so I have a, a good friend, um, like I said, who's my co-founder, Javier Gutierrez, who runs an NHL team, team in Arizona. So like, oh, also, wow. but he, ha he is a financier. He's been in finance forever. Private equity guy, you know, everything you would think about. Stanford. Harvard graduate, like the perfect financier and also brilliant and an incredible human. Yeah. He was like, I have your next company. I'm like, my next company is my philanthropy. That's what I'm going to do. And maybe raise a small fund because I'm already an angel investor. So I want to yeah. not just mentor, you know, Latina founders, but really be able to cut them larger checks. Uh, and he was like, horrible idea. Like, this is why we need this. And, you know, really convinced me that Fintech companies had not worked for Latinos so far just because people thought product first. And I think I, I started by saying that, right? Yeah. Like build a product and they will come is a theory. And when you are able to raise a lot of capital to test and learn and fail and spend millions of dollars seeing if you're going to have market product fit or not, I guess that's okay. But even with that, they haven't been able to say, hey, we own all Latinos or we own the majority of the Latinos at scale. Really, nobody could say that on a fintech side or on a traditional financial institution side. And he was like, I think we need somebody like with your background, knowing how to really, you know, you understand this demo, but really knowing how to lead community first and then do the testing and learning on the community. Mm. Like, yeah, and I thought at first, like I said, he, this is crazy. But then everything I saw, everything I read was like a sign to do it. And I thought, okay, I'm going to give it a try and see if I mix finance with culture and with pop culture, would it work? And when I started to see that it did, I was incredibly privileged to have a lot of investors at that time just uh, were like, oh, we, we want to fund you, you know, we want to yeah. fund whatever it is that you're doing next. And I, I felt really scared to be honest because i'm like wow like this is not my background mind you you hire people that that is their background and right, you can right. still lead a company but i didn't want to be like sitting in panels and not understand even the terminology like this is not my world so in me i'm a type a virgo person overachiever <laughs> so i enrolled in every professional certificate available and it was COVID, so everything was available online and I did everything, you know, from Berkeley to Wharton to Harvard to Stanford, like every oh, wow. single one that was available on finance, on fintech, on blockchain technologies, on cryptocurrencies, on everything. And, you know, was up very late, worked hard on weekends, aside of building the company and, and made a pivot. And it was really exciting to see that at 50, I was able yeah. to make such a dramatic change in my life, right? Like I didn't. I didn't think this is all I know. And now I'm 50. I should just yeah. be 
be comfortable. So yeah, it was, it was crazy, but exciting at the same time. I think, you know, being able to just learn something very, very different, but also I am using a lot of the skills that I had in my previous yeah. career in what I do now. But yes, it was like drinking out of a fire hose and <laughs> it was exciting. That's great. What's been the biggest surprise for you so far? I mean, I, you, obviously, maybe you surprised yourself with what you've accomplished and, 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 and how, how you've been able to make the pivot. So that's, that must feel really wonderful. But has there been anything that you just like caught you by like, wow, I just, this is not what I expected so far? I mean, I think that, um, I think that in general, not just for this company, I think something that always surprises me is that you really know more than you think you do. Right. And I think Mm. this is especially true for women in general, who we tend to still have that sort of like imposter syndrome, um, in things that we do, we're like, Oh, we're not prepared enough. We're not this. But there's, there's always a life experience is so critical and important Mm. in anything that you're going to do. So I'm constantly surprised that anytime I'm anxious, whether it's a big board or whether it's a company in an industry that I don't really know, um, that your life experience has so much weight in the way you make, I think, smart decisions, you know? So that, that, that's something that constantly surprises me. I mean, as a, in the company, it surprised me that Gen Z's wanted to retire early for sure. Um, And also surprised me that really kids that were very, very young, you know, in college in their early twenties or late teens were managing so many financial accounts for their family members, right? Managing Mm. three on average in our platform, they're managing three additional financial accounts for older family members. And you ask them, how comfortable are you managing your finances? They're like, not comfortable at all. I don't understand my finances at all. But then again, for for listeners or viewers, this is really an important data point, right? Like if you're yeah. trying to sign in a new client, you can potentially sign four if yeah. you target that influencer in the family. And, and at least in our communities, it tend, or in any immigrant community, it tends to be the youth, right? And so you can't miss that. You're like, oh, wow, if I have this this from younger generation they'll bring in the additional family it's never an roi of one to one that's always very surprising yeah. to me it's always an roi of one to many we're a very communal uh uh community you know in a way yeah. right like yeah. we're just like coming packs so that's interesting and but also really i think a really incredible opportunity not just for financial advisors, but just for anybody wanting to grow their business or their companies. I tell you what, you you were talking about things that surprised you, but that also surprised me that that's the thing that surprised me the most in our prep call. You mentioned that whole three to one, you know, so the, at the average, you know, young uh, client with Suma uh, is, is, is bringing on three accounts that they manage for grandma, mom and dad, aunts, uncles, whoever. Yep. I'm like, Oh my gosh, you just cracked the code for the biggest problem in wealth management right now, which is, you know, they need to get younger, right? The average age yeah. of a financial advisor in today in America is 60 years old, roughly. Wow. And that means their clients are likely between 55 and 65, right? That's just the way it usually works. And so every wealth management firm out there is banging the drum on, we need to get younger clients in here. We need millennials, we need Gen Z, whatever. We need the younger folks as our clients because that's the future. And so the messaging has been, you need to connect with the heirs of your clients because at some point in time, your client either may pass away or they may need to go into an assisted living facility and the kid's going to take over the, the money. And if that happens, you might see the money leave. So go connect with the heirs. But the strategy of why don't you connect with young people, you actually might get the older folks in the process is a really interesting one to me. It's like, because I, I think it's, it may be more prevalent in the immigrant community and there's reasons for that, right? Like, well, if you came to this country and English is a second language for you and uh, you're focused on working and making sure your family's safe and just going like, you might not be too fluent in some of the the financial world aspects of, of, of life here in the US. And so your your children who grow up here and are fluent in English and are educated here and they feel more comfortable, uh, yeah, they might be your guide for those yeah, types of that's things. That's exactly it. That's exactly it. Which is makes I, a lot of sense if you think about it. I, yeah. And like we said, yes, it's more 
prevalent in immigrant uh, communities. But I also have, you know, a, a lot of friends who are like, well, I, I do that for my family and they're not immigrants, right? Nor are their parents or grandparents. There just gets an age where it's like you're you're it, right? You're tagged with the responsibility. Like I trust you. Technology is also foreign to them, right? So yeah. it's like, oh, you know, my mom, for example, I'm like, why are you dressed up? And she's like, I'm going to the bank. I'm like, for what? And she's like, to check my balance. I'm like, and she's getting dressed what? up. I'm like, I can check your balance right now. She's like, yeah. no, because maybe they'll hack my account. On my mom, no one's gonna hack your account. Like, <laughs> uh, like, uh, trust me, right? But. There's also that there's like, you know, technology moves very fast. Fintech is different for them. You know, I, I'm always like, you don't need to deposit a check. I'll just take a picture of it and deposit it here. But there's distrust, yeah. right? And yeah. Um, so, yeah, there's a lot that at some point, the older generations start leaning into the younger generations for, for advice. Sure. You know, it just reverses. Yeah. So it's it's good to be in business with them. But then again, I'm telling you that that those summer internships are a good way to start. Yeah. I mean, in LA, we we have incredible ones where the city pays for the internships for you. Oh, wow. So anybody listening who's in LA, hit me up on LinkedIn. But move I'm to sure LA and get some free interns. <laughs> I'm sure, I'm sure there's programs everywhere yeah. because yeah. they want to make sure that, you know, kids who usually you know, don't have the privilege of their parents calling other family friends, getting them those internships, yeah. are able to get those opportunities. So they're paid interns. They're exactly the demo that you want. You get to interview yeah. them, pick them, and then really use them for that knowledge that might be on your blind spot of yeah. things that you're not thinking about. I love it. I love it. Just to just kind of close the loop on the younger generation of clients, potentially, like in the United States, this will actually surprise a lot of people. I could be wrong, but the last time I checked, it, I think this is still valid. Only about 30% of Americans have a, high, a college diploma, like a graduated college. People, think, and people in my demo are like, what? Like everybody I know has a college degree. I'm like, yeah, everybody you know went to college. Right. And most of the people I know went to grad school. But think about when you, last time you went into Starbucks or the gas station or the wherever, like a lot of those are not college educated folks. It doesn't make them any less of important people in our society, but yeah. like they, not everybody went to college. Right. And so for many families, I'm the first in my entire family to graduate with a four year degree and then get a master's degree. Many members of my family, aunts and uncles, moms, dads have asked me questions over the years about finance stuff. Right. Like, right. so right. it's very common for that. Yeah, they to look come. up so to it, you. Of course, or they just they yeah. just know you know stuff, and they figure like right. I'm gonna run this by Mike. What he thinks, yeah, right, <laughs> just the, right. It's so that basic. You're you know? the perfect target, right? Like for any for sure. financial advisor, you're like I want Mike because your family's gonna trust who you trust. That's right. That's right. Right. They're gonna they the absolute and and that's been true. Like we talked to you and I were talking earlier about like technology adoption. Yeah, I was the first one who had a cell phone. I was the first one who was you know on on all these social media apps and so forth. And I brought family members to it. And so, yeah, they're constantly looking to you as the early adopter uh, in their lives. And so great strategy. Um, uh, let's talk a little bit about the beyond the Latinx communities. That's, that's fascinating to me. You also mentioned that 30% of your users, clients are not the Latinx community. What attracted them? So like, because you talked about a lot of your marketing and so forth is like, you know, tell us you're Latino without telling us you're Latino. It's very cultural specific and so forth. How did you attract people who are like not in that community? What, 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 what is it about Summa Wealth that brought them there? I think it's just um, a very different take on finance, right? Mm. I think, you know, most financial institutions say, oh, we already have a financial education program. We already have this. And they do, but, you know, it tends to be pretty dry, you know, pretty, mm -hmm. um, you know, n there's nothing fun or funny or that you're yeah. like, oh my gosh, I have to share this. This is just very clever, right? And, yeah. and that's what we aspire to do with finance. And because it's in English, you know, really everybody's welcome. I think that for other colleagues of mine who focus on the more immigrant uh, Latinos, and they do it in Spanish, it's hard that you could share that, right, with friends yeah. and family. Something also super interesting that I learned in my previous uh, company is that young Latinos have the most diverse group of friends. So that's really interesting. Hmm. So most kids, about 80-20 is their group of friends, right? So 
black, white, Asian, etc. Sure. Latinos, it's the opposite, right? So I don't know if it's because we already have such large Latino families that are, you know, <laughs> so out there and so many cousins and so much that were like, oh my God, let me just choose my friends that are not Latinos. But um, they have a very diverse group of friends. So when you, and they're big share, they share a lot on social media. Mm. So I think um, just having that pride of like, you know, this is me, look at me, this is something from my culture that they can share among their friends has been big, especially on social. And then coupled with finance, I think that people are like, listen, I, I want to learn about my credit score with an avocado versus, you know, an 800 <laughs> and 200 chart. Yeah. Um, yeah. I want to learn how ripe my credit is, right? Is it guacamalo or is it guaca ready? Um, so sure, that's for Latinos, but you mm. still laughed, right? Like, it's like, yeah. of course, like, so it's, we want to make sure that if you're a Latino kid, we connect emotionally with you and that you're like, oh, wow, like, this is like me, this was for me, this, somebody get, that gets me did this, but obviously everybody else is included. So we are very hyper-focused on that, but we also know that in that specificity, there's just interest from other people of like, yeah. oh, wow, I've never seen finance like this, right? Um, so I think that's what's attractive. And, and obviously, as all of our cultures become more mainstream, um, whether it's Black culture, Latino culture, um, yeah. you know, other people get it, right? So you're like, yeah, yeah, this is cool. Like, you don't have to be one specific um, demographic to enjoy something from another one, whether that's food sure. or music or fashion. Um, so I think here we're sort of like carving that category, but it, within finance, just really leaning hard into culture um, to make finance yeah. pretty accessible. I love it. And of course, now I'm crazy in the mood for avocado or guacamole or something go. like that, which I have. Ha I have <laughs> avocado almost every day in my life, just so you know, as part of my breakfast, I have a half an avocado. But I love now it. I'm my husband <laughs> was like, I never had avocados till I met you because like, you know, he's from yeah. Newton, Massachusetts. I'm okay. like, what? You didn't, you didn't eat avocados in Newton. I mean, no. obviously now I'm sure everybody eats avocados anywhere. But he was just like, I can't believe I have daily avocado. I'm like, yeah, in my household. We had avocado yeah. with everything, right? Like they put a little side plate of avocado with like breakfast, lunch, and dinner. Um, well, I'll tell you something. But, it, I'm from Massachusetts. I think I mentioned that to you no, in our, so. uh, I think our prep call. Yeah. 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 So, and I know Newton well. So, uh, so if he's in our same age demo, like avocados weren't a thing growing up, it was really no. rare. And, and, and the diversity of foods also changed dramatically in our lifetime, like in our adult life, all of a sudden all sorts of different eclectic restaurants came about and so forth. And grocery stores got much larger and had much, you know, a better options. But here's the funny thing. So I'm in Austin, Texas now and avocados are cheap here, right? Like you yeah. can get like, you know, three, four, I guess you're closer to Mexico. So it's yeah, like, that's in why. LA, they're not that way. cheap. You have to go to like go a specialty Mexican market and they're decent, yeah. but they're incredibly uh, expensive. I was up in mass few years ago and i'm like i gotta get some avocados and i went i was like is it really a dollar fifty per avocado i was like oh, whatever it was worse. yeah i was like yeah i, I think a dollar so fifty is still good price is it no i know my wife always teases me she's like you're an idiot when it comes to food prices i have no idea i think everything is a good That's price so i got yelled at for eight dollar grapes one time i got <laughs> I came home like oh i got grapes God. she's like did you spend eight bucks for grapes I'm like what <laughs> anyway yeah that's a, that's yeah. crazy I know. Anyway. Uh, okay. Last question before I let you go. Of course. Uh, what's next for Suma? Uh, because I mean, you, it, I'm so excited. You, you've, you've raised some capital. You've passed a million users, which is amazing. And congratulations to everyone on the team. What's next? Yeah. So we've passed a million users on all of our platforms. So that means, you know, our newsletter, our websites, our yeah. Um, but we need to convert those users and beyond to our app, which is just yeah. recently out. And we're still fine tuning the last things to really be able to start with that with that process. Um, so, yeah, really migrating everything into the app before the education was in a, in a separate platform um, that you could do in an app, in an MVP. You could do a financial checkup, a budget, track, track your spending, all these things, um, just like most personal finance management apps. Um, but now we're putting everything inside the app. So you'll be able to get your all your courses and your financial certifications nice. and your checkups and your re recommendations of how to do better um, or how to save um, 
directly inside the app, even like, yo, you're spending this, but here's an offer to save half and things like that. So we're excited about that to to convene everybody inside that app and and hopefully to be able to to convert them. So um, that's that's our big goal this year. We're continuing with our enterprise sales, uh, which really we offer up the subscription for the app to companies that want to give this as an employee perk. Um, so that's great. Some of them want to do it for customers, so that's great too. Um, so I think those are our two biggest goals to really get that app um up and running. I mean, it's up and running, but really scale it up yeah. and continue with our enterprise push. And yeah, I mean, continuing to serve our, our, our community and anybody else who's interested. Fantastic. So the website, sumawealth.com. Right. Uh, also, so is there an app in the app store? Yes, an app in the app okay. store. Perfect. Yes. App in the app store. Make sure we get same, that linked up name. as well. Okay, yeah, so but if you go to the, the website, you can down. There's like a link to download there as well. Perfect. But yes, also from the App Store. Perfect. And you active on LinkedIn? Where else can we find you? Are you hang it out on anywhere else online where people can find and follow along with Sumo Wealth? Yeah, well, Sumo's everywhere. You know, we're actually they say always use that uh, Little Mermaid strategy. So for Sumo, we do like fish where the fish are. That's the Little Mermaid <laughs> yeah, yeah. strategy. So obviously we're on Instagram and on TikTok and on Facebook. Uh, so those are, I would say, our biggest platforms and obviously our own website. Um, for me, I would say I'm the most active professionally on LinkedIn. Um, okay. Personally, I love Instagram. So I post some stuff there of like what I'm eating that day or where I'm traveling yeah. to. Uh, but professionally, the easiest way to connect for sure is on LinkedIn. Wonderful. Well, this has been fantastic. Thank you very much for coming on the show. Thank you for having me, Mike. Thank you very much for listening to and or watching this episode of the Modern Financial Advisor podcast. It's always fantastic to have you with us. Huge thanks to Beatrice for joining me. Love this conversation and honestly, I'm very inspired by her journey. I love having people on the show who not only kind of talk nuts and bolts of like what they're doing and why it's important for you as a financial advisor to do the things I do or use the thing I sell, whatever. I like when people share their journey of like how they got there. And uh, I just found it very inspirational. Awesome stuff, right? Jumping from the entertainment field into the fintech field and doing so with a purpose. Really fantastic. And I really appreciate her generosity of sharing what they've learned at Suma with us on the show. So hopefully you can implement it in your business and help more people. All right. That's all I have for you today. Uh, make sure you... Uh, be nice to each other. We'll see you next time on the Martin Financial Advisor Podcast. See ya. Bye.